morning. Happy New Year. Welcome. Let us stand together and sing Once in Royal David City. The grace, Lord Jesus Christ, be with you. And also with you. Happy, New Year. Happy New Year. And good morning. So glad to have you with us as we worship God together. And welcome to all those who are worshiping with us online. We gather here on the first day of the year to worship our good and gracious God. And we gather here for fellowship this morning. So turn to your neighbor and bid them a Happy New Year. Good to have the rain last night, wasn't it? Yeah, we can take that. We can use that. So our chancel flowers this morning are in memory of Tally Parrish on her birthday. Aren't they beautiful? Thanks to Leslie and Bill. Let's pray together. Lord, at the beginning of this new year, be among us now our living God as we come to hear your word, to gather in the name of Christ to be led in the way of mercy and grace, and to receive your love and strength, that we might serve and share 
in your ministry and mission. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. God is inviting us here to worship him this morning, so let's join together in this call to worship inspired by Psalm um, 148 and 150. Let no one of God's wonderful works be silent this day. Bright stars, high mountains, the depths of the seas, sources of rushing rivers, may all these break forth into song as we sing to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May all the angels in the heavens reply, Amen, Alleluia. Let us stand together and praise God in singing.
Hear now our call to confession. What can we offer back to you, O God, in response to your love and grace to us? We offer you now our hearts. It is your kindness that leads us to repentance, O Lord. Let us pray. Ever patient, God, we are a people who live in thick darkness. We stumble around bombarded by news of war, poverty, famine, loss, and pain. We so easily lose our bearings. The turmoil of life can overwhelm and paralyze us. Help us to be people who shine the light of your righteousness, your peace, and joy into the dark places. Open to us the mystery and glory of the babe born in Bethlehem. Guide us with your star of wonder and turn our aimless wanderings into journeys of purpose. Hear us now as we come to you in this moment for personal silent and confession. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Trust in this good news. In Jesus Christ we are loved, we are forgiven, and we are made whole. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite um, a very, uh, my neighbors who are Eric and Elena and Xander Lacruzier, if you'd come up. And we're going to baptize Xander this morning. And uh, then I'd also like to invite up the God family. So this is the Creel family. It's Michael, Candace, Camden, and Nixon. And they're going to come and stand back here. Look at this happy boy. Hi, Xander. Are you ready for this? Hi. I know. I'm so excited. Okay. Yeah, I know. Here we go. Are you ready? Our Lord Jesus Christ told his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, lo, I am with you always until the very end of the age. Eric and Elena, when parents bring their children for baptism, it means that more than any earthly benefit, they desire God's blessing on their child and God's guidance for them in raising their child. In New Testament times, Christian parents baptized their children, looking forward to the day when their child or their children would confirm the vows taken for them and embrace the faith, faith of Jesus Christ for their own. In presenting Xander for baptism, you acknowledge your faith in Jesus Christ and show that you want Xander to be his disciple. And so I ask you, Eric and Elena, do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? We do. 
Do you intend Xander to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? We do. You'll get one of these later, Xander. Hang on. <laughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ told us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of this church representing the church universal, promise to tell Xander the good news of the gospel and help him to know all that Jesus commands and by your fellowship to strengthen his family ties with the household of God. Do you? Yes. There you go, Xander. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> Xander, Xander, hello. <laughs> Xander, for you, little one, the Spirit of God moved over the waters at creation. Yes. And the Lord God made covenant with his people. It was for you, Xander, that the word of God became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. For you, little one, Xander, Jesus suffered death, crying out on the cross, it is finished. For you, Xander, Christ triumphed over death, rose in newness of life, and ascended into heaven to rule over all. All this was done for you, Xander. Though you do not know any of this yet, we, your church family, promise to tell you this story, the story of good news, until the day that you make it your own. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your faithfulness and your promise in this sacrament and for the hope we have in your son, Jesus. Baptism as the visible sign of an invisible reality. By this visible sign of water, God puts his sign on you, Xander, to show that you belong to him. As we baptize with water, O oh God, baptize us with your Holy Spirit, so that what we say may be your word and what we do may be your work. By your power, may we be, be made one with Christ our Lord in common faith and purpose. Amen. Amen. All right, Xander, now is the time. Are you ready? I'll take that as a yes. All right, we practiced this. Not really, not with water yet, though. Xander Francis Lachusier, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, this is a really big moment for this family, and um, so Eric has written a prayer, and he wants to uh, pray for Xander and for the family, so we're going to have him do that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so incredibly thankful for this gift that you have given us our son Xander. It's been amazing to see him transform over the past year from a happy little baby to a happy little boy and see the joy that he brings to everyone around him. As Xander's community of family, friends, we know the journey ahead of him is going to be a long and winding road. We pray that you take the wheel of Xander's life today as you've taken the wheel of ours and guide him on his journey every step of the way. We pray that Xander's relationship with you grows stronger and stronger as the years go by. We pray that you give us, as his parents, his family, and his friends, the strength and wisdom to set a positive, loving example for Xander to follow. When Xander gets lost, God, we pray that you help him find his way home. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful prayer, Eric. And Xander, this is a, your baptismal certificate. I know it's almost your birthday, and it's the first day of the year. I know. It's so exciting. And this is a Bible for you to have right. your folks, your parents read. It's the beginner's Bible, and it's exciting. So here's Xander. Welcome him into the family. There you go. I'm going to hold him up. See what love the Father has for us, that we should be called the children of God, for that is what we are. Amen. Amen. All right, I love you guys. All right.
Good morning, afternoon. It feels like afternoon, but good morning. <laughs> Just to let everyone here know, pretend you like me because my in-laws are here watching. <laughs> the first thing they said when they figured out Courtney was dating me is, does the pastor know his name? So my name is Cameron, if there's any pastors here. Um, I think, yeah, they know me. So if you want, if you want clarification, these two people know me. Um, so I'm stoked that some pastors know me now, and hopefully my in-laws seal of approval. Thanks, guys. <laughs> he should have asked, do the pastors like me? Because uh, my last sermon topic was possibly a little gruesome, and I, I think this one is also there. So uh, I think that would have been a better question. But starting off, also, your baby is absolutely adorable. That was the cutest thing I've ever seen in my life. So we're going to be going over Matthew chapter 2 today, uh, and there's two things that I want us to focus on as we're reading through this and as we're going through this together is, why did Matthew add this? Uh, as we're going through this story, it's a very fair question. Why did he write this? And how and what are we supposed to do with this? How are we supposed to respond to this? Uh, because as I was reading it, that was the question that was just going through my mind, why and how, all the time. So starting with verse 13. Now, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child, the child being Jesus, to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of the Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated and sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under. According to the time that he had learned from the wise men, then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and the mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Arculius was ruling over Judea in a place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. To start off, there are two ways that Matthew uses prophecy in this passage. Way one is, he goes, okay, they said this about our Messiah, and now it's, being, now it's being done. So a little bit of that's fulfillment prophecy. Another way that he's using prophecy is he's quoting Old Testament scriptures. He's quoting prophets, not necessarily to prove what they were saying was going to happen, but to tie Jesus back to the past of Israel. The reason he had to do this is because a lot of people did not believe, especially that he was writing to, that Jesus was the Messiah. Matthew was writing to a Jewish audience. The reason that they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah is because they had a preconceived notion of what the Messiah was going to do in their lives. The Messiah was going to be strong. The Messiah was going to be powerful. The Messiah was going to free them from Rome. The Messiah was going to be a warrior king. The Messiah was going to be mighty and militaristic. He was going to bring them back to the glory days. What they got was a baby who not only had to flee from military power, but in his fleeing, other babies were dying. So instead of getting a mighty king who can fight off all the evil, in their mind, from this story, you get a Messiah who has to flee, and you get absolutely brutal slaughter. As I was reading it, I was wondering, okay, if he's writing to a Jewish audience who thought they were going to get a powerful Messiah, why would he write this story in there? If he was trying to convince them that Jesus was the Messiah, as he believed, why would he put this story in there? I think, 
I think he put this story in there because it was tragic. I know that when I wanted a Messiah in high school and in my early years of college, I wanted a Messiah or God or a Savior very similar to the way that I was describing the Jewish people wanted a Savior. I'm sure that you guys could kind of relate, right? Who wants a God that makes all their problems go away? I feel like I'm selling a commercial or not. <laughs> Who wants a God that makes all their problems go away? You avoid every single, yep, if I get a hand back there, thanks, man. <laughs> All the pain goes away. Every time you're about to make a bad decision, a big red light goes up. God's hand comes down from the sky and goes, no, 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 no. Take a left. Do not listen to Google Maps. Go that way. I want that God. I wanted that God. I believed in that God. A God that makes all my problems go away. Whenever I walk somewhere, he rolls out the red carpet. This was my God for a very long time. Um, and then out of nowhere, that God did not fit my worldview anymore because as Stuff happens in your life. It's not always good. My friend passed away suddenly in college, and the God that makes everything good and makes everything painless did not make sense anymore because pain happens. And my view of that God had to change. It didn't make sense anymore. A God that makes everything just go away, makes everything painless, did not make sense with what I was going through at the time. So I think you had, I had two options. I could go, okay, that... My view of God doesn't work, so I'm done with this whole thing. I'm washing my hands. I'm walking away. Or I could keep digging. I got lucky. I was studying religion in college, so I had a, I had a lot of places to dig. I also had two great pastors. And so I kept digging. And what I found were these stories, which is weird. Like I was like reading the Bible. I was like, there are stories in the Bible. This is insane. <laughs> it's not just a bunch of random sayings. But as I was digging... I found the story of Jonah, I found the story of Job, and I found the story of Jesus on the cross, and I found this story. And when I was reading all those stories, the same thing I noticed happened over and over and over again. Man, life sucks. Jonah was not excited about what he had to do. He was sent to a place to go save a bunch of people he absolutely hated. The story of Job is just a story of pain, a story of pain and confusion. Jesus on the cross yells out, why have you forsaken me? I think we've all been there. We've all felt that. Why have you forsaken me? I know that the parents of the children who died in Bethlehem probably felt the same way. I know that the Jewish community at large, who heard that they were getting Messiah, heard about Jesus, probably felt similar when he died on the cross. God, why have you forsaken me? Why, why haven't you done what I thought you wanted for me? Why haven't you done what I wanted you to do? That's what I felt like when my friend passed away. And as I was finding these stories and looking for an answer, I never came to a direct, this is why God did this. I don't, I don't know if I'm ever going to find one. I don't think I will until I get to heaven. But what I did find is that because I was in an awful situation, it had no bearing on God not being with me. Because that's what I thought. I was in this awful, terrible situation. The God that I put on a pedestal and a view was not real. A God that makes everything go away wasn't real. But I found a better God. I found a real God. I found a God who isn't absent because I am in tragedy. I found a God who is more like with me because I'm going through pain. I found a God through these stories, through Jonah, Job, Jesus, and this story particularly. A God doesn't wind around awful. He doesn't wind around tragedy. When you're sad, he doesn't avoid you. He's there with you. He goes through all those things with you. He came to earth not to live a peaceful life, but to bring peace through his suffering. I found a beautiful and real God in Christ. I believe that this story is in there because he's trying to convince them that the Messiah that they believed in, the military Messiah that was going to free them from Rome, that was not a real Messiah. They made that Messiah up. The Messiah that was going to die for them, the Messiah that was going to live with them, the Messiah that says, hey, I'm going to weep for you. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to be with you. You're going through pain. I will sit there with you through that pain. That is the Messiah he is giving them. Hey, your Savior is here. Here's the tragedy. He's not going to avoid it. He's going to live it with you. That's the God that I believe in. And that's the God that's real because life is full of tragedy. I'm sure all of you have gone through a hard moment. If you haven't yet, 
please tell me your secret because then I can preach about it next time. <laughs> but for those of us who have, you're probably going to go through another one. And the Jesus that walks through your pain, that's the one that I'm seeing in this story. The Jesus that walked through his own pain, that had to flee immediately, that had to run for his life immediately. I believe that God's story of hope and love doesn't avoid pain. It goes through it with us. God's story of hope and love is not to avoid pain. It's because of it. God sent his child to earth not because everything was great, but because everything was awful. And he goes, I know it's bad. I'm going to be here with you. I know your friend just passed away. You could try to walk away, but I'm going to love you regardless. I'm going to love his family regardless. I'm going to love all of you regardless. There's going to be hard moments. I'm sure Christmas was great for some of you. I'm sure it was really rough for others. If it was rough, God was still there. If anything, when you read the Bible, God's almost there more in the pain than he is in the happy. He obviously wants you to be happy. He's there in those happy moments. But as you read the Bible over and over and over again, something awful happens and God's there. He goes, I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to make this better. I'm so sorry. I'm going to sit here with you. That being said, it is so hard to tie our story of pain and suffering into God's story. I'm sure that the Jewish people at the time who were reading the story of Matthew, who were suffering, did not want to tie this kind of Messiah into their lives. They go, I don't want a Messiah who's going to sit with me through my pain and suffering. I want a Messiah who's going to go up with a sword and get rid of it for me. But we got something better. We got Jesus. I think he put this story in there to remind them, hey, this is, this is the real Messiah. This is what the real God wants. This is what we get. We get a God who understands our pain. A God who was born into a painful situation, lived a painful life, died a painful death, and he beat it all. But how are we supposed to tie that into our lives? How are we supposed to tie that into our suffering? Reading this story and just thinking about my own life, I had three things that I remember just popped up that, especially during that time, helped me a lot. One was reading and reminding myself of the scriptures and of the stories of other Christians is God's always there in the pain. If you want to meet an older Christian, they're always just going to, they're always going to tell me about their hard times. I feel like whenever I ask anyone who's older and wiser than me about their faith, so often they tell me about their bad times and how God got them through it. When I read through the New Testament and the Old Testament, I just see story and story and story of someone struggling, sometimes with the exact same thing I'm struggling with, and God working them through that. So if you're in a tragic or suffering moment, remember that this book still breathes life. These books and letters still breathe life. Jesus is in all of them, and he's in your story also. The way that he was working for these people is the way he's working for you today. The second thing is prayer. Talk to God. God talks back. It always helps. And third, and I think probably the biggest thing that helps, is be in the church. And when I'm saying in the church, I'm not saying this building. This is a beautiful building. I love this building. The church isn't the building. The church is all of you. If you guys look around, you see the church. Don't look up. Look side to side. That's the church. As God made us his hands and feet, he also made, us our, our, his, he also made our ears, his ears to listen, our eyes to weep with those who are weeping, our arms to hug those who need a hug. I believe Matthew wrote this story because it was tragic. Because after we got the hope of the Messiah, the birth of Jesus, so instantly did he bring tragedy into his story that it just reflects an actual human life. And God is a God who understands an actual human life and is going to be there through your life. I hope that even though this story is brutal, even though it is sad, that it can give you some form of peace knowing that God lives through your tragedies. He walks with you in your tragedies. And just because you're going through something awful doesn't mean God loves you less. He's with you in that pain. He loves you throughout that pain. We love you throughout that pain. Step three, being with the church also means something for the church. If you see someone in pain, it's time to be like Jesus. It's time to love and to hold. It's time to weep with them. I hope to God Laguna never has a tragedy as bad as this one. I hope none of you have a tragedy ever again, but if you do, know that the Messiah makes it back home. 
He conquers death. He conquers sin at the end of this story. That's the good news of the gospel. It might start right here with this tragedy, but it all, it all comes around. If you're going through something hard right now, if you're going to go through something hard, it's going to come around. God's going to be there with you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for being bigger than the box I originally put you in when I was in high school and my early years in college. Thank you for being a God of love and peace. Thank you for giving me hope that perseveres, persevering hope in a future because of you, that you are not absent in pain, but you love despite the pain, despite the suffering, despite my sin and our sin, you still love us. Thank you, Lord, for coming to earth and living the life you did and giving us the hope that you did. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward now as we give generously to the mission and ministry of Laguna Presbyterian Church. doxology. Oh, come, let us adore him. 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 Let us pray. Gathering God, you have brought us together from many backgrounds and life situations to be this church together. 
And so we praise you with songs and these offerings and gifts. Oh God, we ask that you would multiply them for your service, that they and we might make your presence known in the world. This we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we bring the prayers of the people on behalf of the church, so let us pray. Redeeming gracious God, as we begin this new year, we remember how you have cared for us and comforted us. We marvel at the mystery of your incarnation among us, the message of the angels to Zechariah, to Elizabeth, Joseph, Mary, and the shepherds, to wise men. Oh God, give us the grace to see all the ways that you stand beside us, the ways you share our pain and sorrow, and the ways you celebrate with us our joy. Because you came among us, dispersed the gloom of night, and dawned in our darkness, we know that you care. We know that you love us. Therefore, for all those who this joyous season are sad, we pray for those who mourn, who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those families who are divided. for misunderstood youth and for those children who live in fear. Lord, you deemed it good to be born among a people in an occupied land amid war and amid strife where kings raged and soldiers ravaged with the sword. And therefore we pray for all those suffering from war, for those suffering in civil unrest, because you have come to us, we come to you, bringing all those problems of our lives that seem so unsolvable. Offering up to you all of the fears that seem so great. All those matters that perplex us so deeply. That we know not what to ask or pray, and yet, oh God, you know. Grant us the peace on this very first day of 2023, the peace that only you can give. Give us what we need, despite what we think we want. This we pray in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Whenever I hear the sounds of babies and children and students down in the youth center, I say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 So our sermon theme that's coming up this next Sunday through Easter is going to be called In Heaven and on Earth. Those are the words from Jesus at the Great Commission in the Gospel of Matthew. And I think you're going to enjoy this sermon series as we make our way through Holy Week in a few months, and Easter Sunday. So one of the moments you've been waiting for is an update on our generous giving. Well, at the printing of our bulletin, we were about $55,000 away at noon on Friday to meet our generous giving goal. As of 4 p.m. yesterday, we were within $23,000. And while I was watching the Georgia-Ohio State game, I got some text messages from some of you. You can interrupt my football games anytime with those text messages. That giving is still coming in, and we'll, of course, have some letters coming in on Tuesday from the mail from Friday and Saturday and from the generous giving on Saturday evening. Amazing. Amazing as we worked our way through this month to, to meet that generous giving goal, to finish well. And I am so thankful 
for all of your time and your treasures, your talents that you, that all of us have provided to this church through 2022. I'm so thankful for our talented staff and all of our volunteers. But first and foremost, I am thankful to the one who is the giver of all things, our gracious God. And will you pray with me now as I lift up a prayer of thanks. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your goodness, your generosity, your provision for this church that you love, Laguna Presbyterian Church, that we would finish well as we have in 2022. And now you're giving us the confidence to move forward with your mission and ministry for Jesus Christ our Lord into 2023. And so we give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Beth. Well, just a few announcements. You'll notice they're on the back of your bulletin, so I encourage you to take this with you. We have plenty. Um, Monday is uh, an official holiday, so the church office will be closed. On Wednesday, we are going to have our 9 o'clock uh, adult Bible study down in the youth center, and that will be in person only. We'll resume the hybrid study um, the week after. So if you're used to joining us by Zoom, we, you won't be there. we won't be there. You just have to be here in person. Okay, so that's just this, this Wednesday. You see that there. Um, is a chancel choir practicing on Wednesday? Yes, chancel choir is practicing on Wednesday in person. Next Sunday, we resume our normal service schedule. So we'll be in here at 9 for the classic service and at 1030 for our contemporary service. And you'll notice that both of those now will be live streamed. Children's ministry, again, will be at the 1030 along with student ministry. So it's good to see all you kids. You guys made it through the whole service. Well done, Tommy and Tabitha. Good job, guys. Uh, there's a concert coming up on January 14th. It's a Saturday. You can get tickets online. Contrapunctus. Absolutely, Xander. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, it's, a, it's a student organization, um, and they are amazing. They're amazing uh, classic instruments. You will love it. You, the sound system is, just sounds amazing. As, as you heard with Xander, you can hear everything. It's so cool. You will love them. Women, you'll notice the women's retreat is coming up. It's March 17th and 19th. Registration will begin on January 8th. We have limited amount of space, but we're also going to then open the uh, registration up to uh, Tribuco Presbyterian Church and Canvas as well. So Leanne Stroman is our speaker. She's wonderful. She did my installation. What did she do? My charge at my installation ordination service. And the, the, the topic is keep calm and just breathe. <sighs> yes, it's going to be great. So you'll see that there. We're looking forward to that. Uh, I think everything else. Oh, yeah. One last thing. Congratulations to Judy Bell. She won the drawing. She gets a $50 gift certificate to Slice Pizza. So you, too, can be enrolled in the next drawing. Just go to the QR code, check in, get your name in there, because you could be the next winner. And our, as around Easter, I think, will be our next check-in. So check in anytime, but the drawing will be right. That'll be Right, Rachel? Rachel, you sign in right now. Rachel, come on. Um, anyway, $50 to slice pizza, and there you go. I think that's all I have. Did I miss anything, Steve? All right, Cam. Oh, I, so Steve was a baseball coach, obviously not a baseball player. Dropped the keys I threw at him. Oh, but you caught it? We have some baseball players in the audience. Good job. <laughs> Steve told me not to go up here with keys in my hand when I was like in seventh grade. Now I can't think of it. My bad. Uh, let us pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you that I didn't hurt anyone with my keys. Um, I shouldn't be throwing those in a church. Thank you for all the children we have here, um, all of the parents, everyone in between. Thank you so much that we are a multi-generational church that we get to learn so much from each other generation. Thank you for being a God that is with us, and I hope that you bless us, Lord. I hope that you bless us in and through the pain, and I hope that you walk with us in a way that's tangible to us. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. <laughs> I was like playing with the mic.